Hello there. Uh, just a quick note before this week's show to tell you about the Living Daylights episode. Now, sadly, this is not the episode that I planned and recorded due to copyright issue. Uh, this means that instead you will see an episode about the movie. It's just not the one that I'd intended. Why? Well, primarily due to the version of the movie that's been used to obtain clips from the rights, of course, to distribute the film through Dan Jack, um, who in turn had a 15-year distribution deal with MGM. Well, that expired in 2002, which was 15 years after the movie's release. So it will come round again, um, and uh, just as James Bond does, but uh, we will have a plan B. And later on in the year, all of the episodes, um, there's been this one and a previous episode, uh, Commando, they will all become available to you um, on an alternative media platform and I'll give you details of that. I will keep you posted as soon as I know when that's all going to happen. But hopefully this will not uh, take anything away from the episode. So, enjoy. This podcast is brought to you in association with From Sweden With Love, one of the oldest fan sites dedicated to the world of 007. Online since 2004 and also on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Why not check them out today? James Bond 007.se Nobody does it better. <laughs> or as they say in Stockholm these days, Ingen gör det bättre. Every film Every stunt Every story Stunts. Bond stunts. Welcome to the YouTube series. Hello and welcome to this brand new series of Bond insights in uh, Behind the Stunts as we return to James Bond with The Living Daylights from 1987. Um, Paul Weston, of course, took over as stunt coordinator and uh, has a little cameo in the picture as well. It's a busy movie, so let's get on and have a chat with Paul. Yes, um, uh, Living Daylights, when we, we had Timothy for the first time, and I met Timothy out there, and <clears throat> we, we decided we had four minutes to make Timothy Dalton a new Bond. Um, and I could have tied him on the, on the truck and he wouldn't have been able to move, um, and we could have done lots of stuff that, you know, he couldn't have, we wouldn't have allowed him to do. But he's, I trusted him. But when I first met him, I thought, yeah, he's sensible. He, he can, he'll do ex exactly what he's told, um, which he did. Um, and he had faith in me and I had uh, uh, faith in him that he would do exactly what I asked him to do. So when it came to... Um, the jumping on top of the uh, the jeep, we had obviously doubles for that. But coming down the hill, all the close ups we had to we had for him, uh, he was. I put handholds on the top of the jeep. The problem was is deciding what would be the safest for him. If he was tied into the jeep and it turned over, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's not good. Not good. <laughs> if he's not tied to it. Uh, he, at least, you know, he, he's got a chance of, of coming off where he wants to come off. But uh, as he's going down there, I had a platform on the other side of the, the Jeep that you couldn't see. Uh, and I was on there, I was wired on. And every time he's, his leg came over too far, I'd whack it. So <laughs> it, uh, he was knew that he was not uh, going to do too much of a, a, a dangerous stunt. Yeah. 
but he was able to move along the top, do the, the cutting of the um, uh, the uh, canvas, and then put his head in. And then from then on, we had a pair of legs, and, and we we did a lot of uh, stuff with the stunt doubles. But uh, yeah, he he was he showed great courage, yeah. and uh, he was he was very good, and he. He showed he was Bond. I had a, I had about a half a dozen uh, stunts yeah. uh, with me out, out, out in Gibraltar, um, <clears throat> but you never got enough, you know. Um, so uh, when he's coming down the hill, I, I had to have um, uh, Paul Heisman get knocked down by the by the jeep as he's going through the gate, and the Paul was the guy sh shooting at the uh, the barrier. Um, but that's difficult because if you've got a, a Jeep, a high-fronted vehicle like that is to do a knockdown and hit the windscreen and bounce off. Mm. It's very – you can't do it. I mean, you'd have to leap up in the air. Yeah. So what I did was to uh, – I put a mini trampoline attached to the front of the Jeep. So we did the close-ups of going towards him <clears throat> where he goes like that. And then I set, stood him on the front of the, the mini trampoline, and as we got down to the, the place, he bounced and then bounced off the mini trampoline, hit the windscreen, and bounced off <laughs> on the side. So there's ways of, of doing these things that safely that still give you the, the excitement of, uh, of a knockdown. And Paul did a great job on that. So then when we're going down, um, I wanted people to be running in and out uh, across the front of the, the Jeep and so you see me about four times <laughs> with a hat on, not top on, top off, in shorts. and So, uh, yes, uh, you see me leap over over the wall at one time. So, yeah, four times. Four, four times, times, I think, you see me in that little, uh, in uh, probably bit. 30 seconds. Uh, I wasn't going to do it. I'm the stunt coordinator. So um, <clears throat> John Glenn said, you can play this part. I said, no, I, I'm, you know. He said, come on, you've got to play this part. So I, I got lumbered with the part. So <clears throat> Timothy comes down, hits me, and, and knocks me to one side and jumps on the, the thing. Now I'm coming for my close-up. So now I've got all the stunt guys, all the crew, standing around behind the camera going. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got to deliver my, this wonderful line. Yeah. Here, hold on, you're dead. <laughs> so good. Absolutely <laughs> love it. So, yeah, that was uh, – it was uh, – I just about held it together yeah. because uh, they were all behind the camera. <laughs> they, oh. When you do little parts like that, especially as a coordinator, the second unit director, they put you in, then uh, the rest of the crew want to have a go at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was um, a tremendous because I we had first and second units. So I had, um, I had 32 horses – on one unit, 32 horses on the other unit. But they all, uh, because we were blending them, they had to be in the right position with the right help, uh, uh, turbans on and the right. They all looked, they had to look more or less the same. Or do you try to, to, to keep it? So I had, yes, 64 uh, horses, uh, Moroccans and, uh, and English stunt guys and, and Spanish uh, stunt guys. Um, but then you've got to coordinate uh, who's on what unit, who's doubling for what actor. Um, so, yes, it was a tremendous um, uh, thing to put together logistically. And then to have the bulldozer come in and take the, the huts down. Yeah. And it was quite funny. I had um, uh, Roy Allen, who was a great stunt guy, and, um, and Simon. And Simon said to me, I, I wanted two guys to come out in the nude, run out of the the the, the, the uh, house yeah. as it's being pushed down, uh, crushed down. It's supposed to be the, the bathhouse. I went mean, two of them, uh, one of them to run out naked. So um, <clears throat> Simon said to me, "Get, get to Roy to do that." So I said, "Okay, that's fine. Yeah, Roy, you're doing that with Simon." <laughs> <laughs> so, I went, uh, so I got the two of them. Running out of the uh, building, and they left it to the last moment. You can see the actual building, the doorway distorts as they, as they come running out. But they do a great job. And Simon was, uh, did some great explosions on there, apart from uh, doubling for um, uh, other people. At the same. And now we have a chat with Elaine Ford, who was stunt doubling uh, Mariam Darbo in the picture. And so she tells us about her time working on The Living Daylights. We also have a little chat about Oscars for stunts. And it sounds very much like this. 
Yes, and that was another dream come true. How lucky can one get um, when you've always had this dream of working in the desert? And here we are, living daylights, filming in Morocco. Yeah. What could be better? That was that was fun. That was great fun. Living the dream in the living daylights. And, and of course, there was a lot of, oh, <laughs> a lot, a lot of horse work, doubling for Mariam Daba, of course. She did a lot of horse work. Um, and, uh, and also... Uh, so there's the horse, the horsework. There's the jeep driving. Were you were you driving the jeep when Jason jumps on the bonnet? Yes, I was. That was you, was it? Right. <laughs> yes, and um, yeah, and, and, and so as he jumps on the bonnet, and then she switches the wipers on. Do you yes, remember? That's right. Um, and uh, yes, and then he eventually falls off, and that leaves the character free to drive across and head towards the plane that Bond is in. So that was good fun, but obviously there were um, there was lots of sort of special effects and guns firing and and lots of sand everywhere. So I I I just had to focus on getting to the plane, but it was um, it was quite exhilarating. I must admit, obviously they would have filmed uh, um, certain sections separately, but I mean there there were sections there. I'm guessing there were probably three or four cameras running at one time, just to catch all of the action yes. in one go, wasn't it? Um, so as far as uh, the doubling there on on um, on Living Daylights was concerned, of course that the, you did mention. I seem to remember that the um, of course the you couldn't drive into it, the, the plane itself. It was a furniture vehicle, wasn't it? Which was which was kind of uh, redesigned to accommodate the the, the the van going in, as as I seem the jeep going into the back of it. But did, you didn't yes. drive it in, is that right? No, that's right. So my job was to literally line up the car and drive just to the edge so that the wheels just went over the base of the ramp. Right. Um, and then the rest of it was done in the States a little bit later on. Oh, okay. um, so it was, yeah, it would have been nice to have done the whole thing, but obviously there was a reason behind it. But that's, that's what I did is just to line it, just to line it up. Well, you know, your involvement, uh, as with everybody's involvement in these pictures, is, is so important. That's why a project like this is, is so important to me and to many, many other people who, who maybe don't receive, certainly don't receive the, the credit that they deserve. Uh, and even though you may think you're only a very small part of it, you are a very small part of it. But without you, you know, this is the whole point of the, of the exercise. Well, people say, well, if you take the, it's a Bond movie, you take the action out of a Bond movie, what are you left with? Well, you're, you're probably left with a... 20 minute art you know a noir picture with, with not much not much action going on a very complicated plot but you know it's a, it's a massively important part of the of movies not only then but now as well it is but do you know what john how i perceive that is that we yes it would be great if stump people were nominated for oscars but I look at it as um, it's a, it's a job, mm -hmm. isn't it? And and my job and other stunt performers' job at that time was to make the artists, make the stars look good. Mm -hmm. And I guess I didn't worry too much about, well, actually, it's it's not fair because they're going to get all the credit and oh, I'm, sure. I'm not. To me, as long as I did a good job and I made them look good and the stunt coordinator was happy, the director was happy, mm. then I was happy. It, it, it is really. a different. It's a different world now. There's no choice about that. I mean, certainly, yes. if when you were doing those two movies, as an example, um, you know, the last thing that that um, Martin Grace or Bill Weston, for instance, would have even considered is the idea of, of of receiving an award for doing the job that they're doing because they are of a different generation. So I, I do see that. Um, but the way in which film is changing these days, and the way in which perhaps. Um, the understanding of what stunt people are and what they do has changed. That that has made a difference, perhaps, and maybe that because the public are now thinking, well, hang on, if they're doing this particular job, which is a very large part of of the job, not only on set but also, you know, before, afterwards, motion capture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the possibilities are endless, um, and yet if. Um, sound, for instance, or hair and makeup, or whoever are receiving awards of this nature, is it conceivable that everybody should? Maybe that's a, a possibility the way they're thinking. 
Exactly. And maybe, um, John, it's, it's come to this because stunts obviously have got bigger and mm. better. Yeah. And the more technical we've become, the more um, proficient people are mm -hmm. uh, with regards to uh, computers um, and it, how far can you go? Yeah. Each each time, it, you know, the next action film needs to be bigger and better. Sure. So, so now, because stunt people are actually really pushing themselves, okay. um, and it's and I don't mean in the sense of you know um, CGI, but mm. they are actually pushing themselves yeah. because we need. It's like anything in life, isn't it? Um, we need to keep improving all the time because people will get bored. It's sure. like what's the next stage and the stage after that. So maybe it's because we are. Um, pushing uh, for the next stage and we are pushing, we are being taken to our limits that people are saying, well, actually, we do deserve this, we do deserve that. Well, that's it for this week. And next week we return with Licence to Kill. So you don't want to miss that. Until next time, bye for now.